G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today we are going to review the entire trade period. There were so many rumors, so many videos I did, and so many conflicting stories that eventually we finally have our outcome. So in today's video, I'm gonna go through club by club and review kind of the total mix, the total net in versus net out of a club this trade period. So there's a few different ways you can do this. I mean, you, you could go through and sort of like forensically analyze every deal and did the club get the most value out of this particular deal? Or you can look at more of the net in versus net out, which is the approach I'm gonna take. And in some cases, you know, there's nuance where some teams made the best of a bad situation or other teams could have capitalized on a situation a little bit better. But nonetheless, we're gonna go through it and rank them all into a tier maker. Thank you once again to all the new subscribers. This is on track to be the biggest month this channel has ever seen, uh, both in terms of views and growth. So I really appreciate everyone jumping on board. In the last 28 days, 113 nearly thousand people have watched a video on this YouTube channel. So I wanna thank you so much. And if there's anyone that's been watching lately and hasn't subscribed, I'd appreciate you do so. And you get plenty more AFL content. We're gonna go through right until the draft and continue to be active through the off season as well. But Without further ado, let's get into this video. Great, so as you can see, I've got tier maker open and I'm just gonna rank it into four tiers today. I'm gonna have those who smashed it, those who were productive, so a net positive, those were moderate. This sometimes it will include teams where I'm not sure whether it was positive or negative in my opinion. Or, you know, there is a handful of teams that were probably a little bit inactive or it's unclear what their biggest strategy is. And then not ideal. I've got, you know, a handful of teams here where I thought this trade period didn't really reflect what I thought they were trying to do at this current point in time. So those are our tiers. And when I go through on the AFL website, the wrap that they give you, where it just neatly sets out a summary of everything that went in and out. So naturally, this is gonna be alphabetical. Let's start with the Adelaide Crows. So who arrived? They got Isaac Cumming, Neil Bullen, and James Peatling. Three good players without being necessarily elite. But Neil Bullen did have a very good year. I think he finished third in Melbourne's in, uh, injury-affected season. Uh, third in their best and fairest. Um, he is a good player. About 28, I think. Pete Ling, obviously that happened on the deadline. That got done for a future second with future thirds and fourths coming back to Adelaide. And Isaac Cumming, I think, is a very talented young man who was signed as a free agent. So in terms of what they gave up, there was a couple of second rounders. They traded a 46 into the future. So in terms of their 2025 hand as well, um, they don't have a second rounder, but they have at least two third rounders, I think. In fact, they should have three future third rounders. So there's not too much out of the next year's draft. So if you look at this draft hand here, 464 and 82, um, it doesn't, you know, it's not outstanding, but for what the way brought in, and only losing Himmelberg, who was a depth player at this stage, and still in a really good position to potentially take Sid Draper, that's the rumor anyway, um, or at least a very good midfielder. I think Adelaide have smashed it. I think in terms of cost versus what's been brought in as one of the younger teams of the competition, one of the very youngest teams by selected team, to bring in three established players that will help them improve now and not sacrificing their position in a strong draft. I think Adelaide has done just about as well as, well as anyone. So we're gonna go to uh, Adelaide here and put them in smash it. That's a really good start. Now we've got the Brisbane Lions. They were relatively inactive. So we know that obviously they won the flag. Their goals were likely to never be a track star talent um, because you know I'd imagine their salary cap's full. Sure, Danaher retired, that might free up some money, but I'd imagine, you know, they're pretty well set at Brisbane. I do believe they're gonna sign Sam Day as a delisted free agent, which hasn't happened yet. Um, so that is a bit of a loss, but technically Danaher going out, it's not part of the trade period. So um, who left? Just Harry Sharp. We did think maybe Jackson Pryor, he might be delisted. I think he might be out of contract. Um, and Dev Robertson is contracted. They did not switch clubs. Um, and we know that a lot of this, what they've got done here in terms of draft picks, is really just a play to get points for Ashcroft and uh, Sam Marshall, of course, in this year's draft. Now, how do you assess this? Because they weren't super active. Um, you know, there's a little bit of luck there with father sons, so they're in a great position. If you want to say, like, who's going to come out of this offseason sitting pretty, Brisbane Lions would have to be one, uh, one of the teams up there. But if we're assessing this trade period, they didn't necessarily have to do much maneuvering. You know, they, they did a good trade with Richmond for some points. Um, we picked 20 is now 27. There was a couple of deals involved in that. Um, so, you know, it was kind of made very easy for them. I'm just gonna put them in moderate here. And I realize that that might not make sense when you consider they're getting Ashcroft and uh, Marshall. 
but uh, assessing the actual trade period itself, Brisbane weren't super active. So let's just leave it as moderate. And it was certainly productive, don't get me wrong. Uh, so it could fall under that category, but there was just so minimal activity that I, I'm just gonna say moderate. Now we've got the Blues. This will be an interesting one to assess. I know that as a fan base, they're really happy about getting pick three and as they should be, it's a very good draft. So who arrived? They got Nick Haynes through free agency. Um, that one is a little bit of a, a depth move. I presume they see him as best 22, uh, but low cost and you know potentially low to medium reward. He could still be a good player, uh, but it'll be short term, you'd think. They lost Matt Owies and Matt Kennedy, two players that they signaled intent to trade, or at least they told these players to look around and these two found homes while Lewis Young stays, which is not a bad outcome. I'm surprised that Lewis Young was even shopped around, to be honest. What have they ended up with? Well. They were the subject of a very interesting trade with West Coast where they traded up 12 and 14 plus Matt Owies for pick three. So from that perspective, you have to say, well done on getting that trade outcome. I don't think many people expected that deal to get accepted. Uh, nonetheless, they got exactly what they were looking for. They also have two Camparelli, Camparelli, Camparelli. I actually remember him as a player, but I'm really struggling with the pronunciation of that. It reads like it should be Camparelli. But people are saying Camparelli, that doesn't make sense phonetically to me, but it's ultimately it's not my name, is it? Anyway, forgive me. I'm going to continue to stumble over that for the rest of their careers. So they've got academy uh, father-son points rather to, to match. So they've done absolutely everything they could. Um, I suppose we do have to acknowledge on the other hand, they did still pay a decent price for this. So okay, 12 and 14 and always is, we didn't expect that to get accepted, but they did do a prior deal with that for, uh, with Hawthorne where they gave up a future first and a future second. So it's really 12, 14, a future second, and Matt Owies for pick three. So look, they got that, what they wanted, but when you look at the bigger picture, that's not necessarily a bargain. Now that could pay off, don't get me wrong, but I'm probably leaning towards more productive in this sense. I think Kennedy and Owies, you know, th those are not really important players, but Owies was like one of the most prolific small forwards in the league this year by goals, if I'm not mistaken. He had 33. And uh, I think he was third in their goal kicking. So we don't want to ignore that entirely. I'm going to say productive. I don't think it's quite in the threshold of smashed it. But again, you, you probably look at a bigger picture here and say if they get Finn Sullivan, it becomes a Brownlow medalist. This trade period will live on as one of their most productive and, and most successful. But as it currently stands, I think they paid a reasonable amount of assets to get into the top three. They did get a lot of these points, but now don't really hold a presence in next year's draft. So that all being said, I'll put Carlton in productive. I think they'll be happy. I'm not trying to talk it down, but I don't think it's quite on the level of smashed it. Next, we got the Collingwood Footy Club. These guys did really well, it has to be said. Uh, so who arrived? They got Dan Houston done um, the day before deadline day or the day off. I can't actually remember now. But you almost forget they also got Harry Perryman. So that's not insignificant. Two players in their prime, uh, one dual All-Australian and one underrated good good role player um, who really both add some drive and potentially midfield rotations to a team that in terms of age profile has a lot of players falling over the edge you know, over the next two years. So I think these are really good moves. And it cost them Joe Richards and John Noble. Okay, both team, both players wanted to leave. Both players probably, you know, certainly not locked in best 22. So a little bit of depth goes out. But if it's two for two, you'd say that's a big upgrade. And it also cost them a future first, which we know was probably going to get absorbed. Most likely, it's too early to conclude that, but probably absorbed with a father-son bid on Tom McGlone. So they're always in a good position there to trade out that future first. They don't have a presence in this year's draft really. However, the, the clear strategy here has to go for the here and now. And I really didn't think they were gonna shake Dan Houston loose. I'm a little bit surprised that deal went through. And considering Collingwood did pay up for that, but it was four decent assets that made one really good asset in Dan Houston, which isn't normally how trades work. So from that point of view, they got their man. I think Collingwood smashed it. I think they have done it as well as anyone in this trade period, and they will set themselves up for some you know, medium term success, I would say. Let's go to Essendon. They didn't get a lot done in this trade period. So they went into this trade period with holding pick nine, and um, we know that they've got an academy player in Isaac Kako, who I finally think I've worked out how to say that. Um, so that one was an awkward one where that whole, that pick nine probably sat around the range of a bid. I, I, I can only imagine that's what Essendon were thinking. I thought it might come later, but I, I'm probably wrong on that. So with the danger of pick nine being absorbed with a pick, with a bid, they moved that on to Melbourne to bank a future first and I think a future second, or is it just a future first? It doesn't actually say here. 
Uh, either way, so they've traded an asset into the future. Melbourne now hold their pick nine, and they don't need to worry too much about um, you know missing out on Kako. They've, they've got the points there. So with Essendon, I think this one is too early to assess because I am almost certain they will trade back into this year's draft with a live trade. And if they do get another first round after a bid for Kako by trading you know Melbourne's future first back in, this could be a very productive period where they've added two first round talents in a strong draft. Now, it's not smashed it, but you know it's too early to really finalize. Now, Jake Stringer did leave for pick 53. That one was a bit of a surprise. You know, they put up a bit of a stance there and um, you know didn't want to extend his contract, fair enough, but he was still relatively important. I think if you keep 40 odd goals, you're an important player to a team's forward line. So they got to replace those goals and they ended up giving him up for 53. So um, look, that's not a trade big enough to break their trade period, but I, I don't think that move really helped their football club as much as it helped Jake Stringer, to be honest. Um, I'm just gonna put them in moderate. I don't think you could say any more than that. Um, Kako coming to their list is a good outcome, although not really part of work that they did in this trade period. They could trade it back in. If they trade back in and get another good first round talent, it might move them up to productive, but we, we don't know that yet. Next, we have the Fremantle Dockers, who um, did have a pretty good trade period when you think about it. Like when you consider which, of the most, which were the most talented players to move club this season. I think Bailey Smith, Shea Bolton, Dan Houston. Um, I think Shea Bolton is in that top category of players to have switched clubs this year. And he's ended up at Fremantle, who are a team that has been building up slowly and it hasn't been linear. They went up, they went down, and this year probably should have made finals. But the, the list is starting to mature. They're starting to move up the rankings of age demographic and getting a player in his prime who was heavily contracted. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't cheap. It cost them 10 and 11, and they got 18 upgraded to 14. But the net result is they get a really good player who I think is going to be a potential match winner. He already is a match winner for Fremantle. He can be that sort of player who takes them to the next step. Um, but in terms of what they traded, it was um, you know a reasonable price to pay. I support their decision to do it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not uh, going to criticize that decision. And he was contracted and Fremantle did have to satisfy Richmond in this instance. So they still hold a first round pick in this year's draft. I mean, you could put that down to last year's trade, um, trade period where they traded into this year's draft and it put them up in a good position ultimately. So where do you put it? It, it is a great play to get, but they didn't get him cheap. And um, in terms of the net in versus net out, they didn't lose anyone. I suppose that's a good start. Maybe just productive. I'd just say productive because it's not necessarily one of those trades period, periods where multiple like players came in. I suppose it's, it's being harsh. It's hard to mark. It's hard to compare against, say, an Adelaide who brought in three players, who are none of whom were as good as Bolton. And Collingwood brought in Perryman and Houston. So Fremantle just paid for one player. And I think it will be really good. But for me, it's probably just one category down. Either way, I'm positive on what Fremantle did. And they still hold a first round draft pick in this year's draft. All right, we've got Geelong here. This one. So it's actually very similar in comparison to Fremantle. So Fremantle prize loose a contracted Shea Bolton. Bailey Smith, I think, is up there with talent with any player that switched clubs this year. However, we are a couple of years removed from his absolute best footy, but he's still like 23. And the cost for Geelong in this instance, it really was kind of a right place, right time. Um, just holding picks 17 and 38. So they ended up getting... 17 and 38 and getting 45 back. That is very, very cheap for what Bailey Smith could have gone for in different circumstances. So they kind of smashed it in a way. I mean, is it unfair to differentiate Geelong and Fremantle in that sense? Fremantle gave up more. They gave up two picks that are higher than 17, uh, albeit they got an upgrade as well. I think I'm prepared to say that Bailey Smith is probably going, this is my opinion though, so my, my opinion is that Bailey Smith is going to be the best performed player out of any anyone traded. So I think Geelong could have smashed it here. You know, they got their player done. It could have easily gone to the preseason. Mind you, that's also true of Fremantle. Am I being unfair there? Let me know in the comments. But I think Geelong's outcome, considering it was far cheaper, and I think, you know, Smith is younger, and I think he could be a better player than Shea Bolton. So maybe I'm being inconsistent there. Let me know in the comments. Either way, both teams should be happy with what they've done. Okay, we're at the Gold Coast Suns. So they got Himmelberg, Noble, and Rioli. So some run and carry out of the back half. Daniel Rioli is a very good player without necessarily being, you know, all Australian caliber at the moment, but it's still very good. And they paid a pretty penny for him. Wow, I struggle with that. Pretty penny indeed. John Noble came from Collingwood, decent depth player. You'd imagine probably best 22, but around that fringe. And Himmelberg would probably be depth. 
So they lost Atkins, they got that contract off their books. They also got the contract of Lukosius off their books. However, Lukosius is a good player. So I, I think I'll differentiate the Atkins and Lukosius situations there. So they paid up, they got the players that they wanted, I suppose, without necessarily it being game-changing. And is the group of talent there between Rioli and Noble that much better than Lukosius? I'm not 100% sure about that. I still think Lukosius is good. However, he did fall out of the team. So nonetheless, they achieved every outcome they wanted to, and they paid a lot for Rioli. Now, the thing is with the Gold Coast Suns, I think they know they do not operate in the same market for talent that every other team does with their academies. So four first round draft picks last year. This year, they get Lombard. Next year, they're gonna potentially have pick one. I mean, that's too early to say. But another academy player who could go at the pointy end of the draft. So pick six does just not mean the same thing to Gold Coast as it does to me to other teams. So Richmond were in the right place at the right time there. Um, they've got a, they're armed with a bunch of you know picks in next year's draft to accommodate this. So they did everything they could have, but I don't think they smashed it. It's just one of those things where there's only so much credit you can give when they have these academy situations absolutely lined up, which other teams do not. So I'll probably put them in productive. I don't think it was, it certainly wasn't moderate. I'd say it exceeded moderate, but they're in productive. GWS, uh, yeah, may, may, are these guys the biggest losers this trade period in terms of ins and outs? Again, it's not a criticism of the club, but look at the outs. Coming and Peatling and Perryman in particular, and less so Haynes, they're all best 22 players, really, I think, certainly on talent. Um, and they brought in Jake Stringer, and that was a cheap deal that they got done. Um, and I can see him playing well there, so fair enough. Good for you. While they've got a good draft hand, I think for where GWS at a club, as a club, losing these players for free agency, or at least two of them, um, and probably not really getting a great deal on Pete Ling, to be honest. I think this is, this is not ideal at all for, for GWS. Now, to be honest, they're a good football club, and good football clubs with a proven track record of success can withstand these sorts of obstacles, and GWS have dealt with this before. So, you know, you look back to 2020, they lost Jeremy Cameron, uh, Aiden Kaur, uh, Zach Williams, and, and four other players that I can't be bothered naming, but they had a massive exodus headlined by Jeremy Cameron, and they actually went up the ladder the next year. So my conclusion there is GWS will be fine, but as a trade period mix, even with a good draft hand, it's not an amazing draft hand. They're, they've got some good picks in this range. This this range of the draft, 15 to 37, is rock solid. So they're not you know, completely screwed. However, I would say for where they're at as a list, it would have been ideal to keep these players. I'm not saying they should have offered overs to keep them. I'm not sure GWS could have done much different in this scenario. But if we look at net in versus net out, they are the first team to fall into not ideal with probably the biggest total loss of players and quality this trade period. Now it's for Hawthorne. So they've got Battle and Barris, um, two distinctly different situations. Battle as a free agent, um, absolutely a home run there, good player, good player, and uh, obviously a positional need for them. Distinctly different to Barris as a player too, who is a bit more of a true key position. Don't know what he actually measures at now, but he's probably about 197. Um, and the thing is they did pay up for Barris. Um, the, what what mitigates that is a good deal they did with Carlton before that where they traded 14 um, for a future first and a future second. So a lot of the picks that went to West Coast were Hawthorne futures and now they hold a Carlton's future first and a future second. So they haven't really traded out a next year's draft. All it really cost them was I think a 14 and a future second if you, if you simplify it for Tom Barris, which is about what everyone expected it to be. So... Did they smash it? They probably did, to be honest. Now, Barris is 29, which Hawthorne fans were quick to let me know before the trade went through, but now I'm sure it's no longer an issue. <laughs> so there is a degree of risk, but look, he's a good player. So I'm gonna put Hawthorne in the top category, I think both from net in versus net out, but also specifically the deal they did with Carlton really mitigated the cost for Tom Barris. So I will put them in the smashed it category. Melbourne, this one is an interesting one. They get Harry Sharp and Tom Campbell, a couple of cheap acquisitions. Uh, last year they got Tom Fullerton. So there's a little bit of a history of uh, looking at depth players at other clubs to try and to build their list. They don't mind that. Neil Bullen left, that's a bit of a shame, good player. Uh, as I said, third in their best and fairest. So in terms of ins versus outs there, probably not ideal. However, they did do a swap with Essendon and they've been aggressive for the second year in a row in getting good draft picks. So they hold five and nine. So it's interesting what's happening here at Melbourne where kind of still in the window. Um, I'm gonna completely park the Clayton Oliver thing from this because he didn't eventually get like a leave. So he's kind of irrelevant to this. That did seem all over the place. So Melbourne have been hitting the draft hard. It's almost as though they anticipate the window 
is just about done and it's probably there while Gorn and Petrarca and potentially Oliver and May and Lever and, and all these types are playing well but they're setting themselves up to be really well prepared for when that happens with Tazzy around the corner. So I like that. I like that they've been aggressive trying to get into the strong draft. What would you say there? It did, it did cost them their future first, so it's not as though it was a massive bargain. I would say productive for Melbourne um, on the balance. Like it, what they set out to do was obviously hit the draft and, and plug a few holes in their depth. So, you know, that's pretty good, I would say. Let's talk about North Melbourne. Um, they were very productive, I would say, in this trade period. So who arrived? They got a couple of senior veterans in Parker and Darling, uh, both from a leadership point of view and a, you know, a structural point of view in the case of Darling. They got their man for Caleb Daniel, perhaps a little bit more expensive than they had anticipated, giving up pick 25 to get him done. But he was contracted, and they got Constanti as stake knives. So it's interesting to try and assess this look i really like what they've done they've come in with a clear strategy of trying to you know bring some experience into the list and some mentors and some of these guys in particular parker despite his age i think can still be a clear best 22 player and caleb daniel has been all australian caliber in the past premiership player of the western bulldogs it's probably been a little while since we've seen the best of him, but I have faith that Clarkson could get Caleb Daniel playing well in a system. Now, Constanti, I have no idea you know, how much to forecast there. Hasn't played a game at AFL level, so it was kind of just like a cheap acquisition of a player, and he's a small four, which is something they need. So they still hold pick two. I anticipate that they will almost certainly trade this down for two picks in the first round. So, you know, whatever way you slice it, they got their experience. They didn't get Dan Houston, but they'll still have a presence in this year's draft, which is strong and full of tools, which they need. So I think North Melbourne are in a great position. I think it would be over-exaggerating it to say smashed it. Maybe getting Dan Houston would have done it. But this is all very productive. And I think, you know, maybe it won't necessarily um, manifest in better results next year. It could. But this is more of a longer term to two to three year play with Darling and Parker to leave a residual benefit to a lot of the players on that list. All right, let's talk about the power. Again, this is another interesting one to assess. So in the end, they did do the Dan Houston deal. He was heavily contracted. I didn't think he was going to go because I didn't think um, the deals for Houston were going to be sufficient regardless of the fact that Collingwood offered pretty much everything they could have to get this done. On the other hand, they did get Lacocious, Richards, and Atkins. Now, the Atkins one is odd. Um, I suppose they're looking for some, is it outside run they're looking for? Um, absorbing the contract. I, I don't really have my head around that one. But they do, over the last like five to 10 years, I feel like Port Adelaide do like their ready-made, established players, even as depth. So it's not inconsistent, I suppose, but um, you know, I don't think anyone expects him to be a best 22 player next year. They did get Joe Richards, and I do like Joe Richards. However, he has only played nine games. So they did need a small forward, though, and um, he looks pretty good to me as a mature age player. I'm a big fan of Lacocious. I think he's a bit of a forgotten talent. And if, if Port Adelaide can optimize their system around getting him the footy, where is the best part of the field for Lacocious to have his footy? Is he a high half forward? Is he a key forward? Is he a running defender? I think he's still really good. Now, he's not a power key forward, no pun intended, but still on talent, very, very good. And um, he is the one here who could really mitigate this deal for Port Adelaide. If Lukosius turns out to be a really good player, which I think he can, then it really does alleviate the, some of the doubts people had about this deal because I didn't think it was going to be enough. And I think that was echoed throughout Port Adelaide's fan base as well. They're surprised it got done. So tough one. From what I've read, Houston really did want to leave. And, you know, I think I read today he had a conversation with Hinckley saying a while ago that he wanted to go and that his public statement of not leaving was to avoid distracting the playing group when they were still in finals. So if that is the case, it does kind of change my mind on this because if Port Adelaide realistically thought they could keep Houston, then I'd probably mark this more harshly. But if they had a player who really wanted to go home, I don't really judge Port Adelaide for trying to get this done, and it would explain why they buckled at the last minute or appeared to buckle. It's hard to know. I think I'm not. I think I'm going to put them in moderates because I just don't know. He's such a quality player, and it really lives and dies by how good Lukosius is. Because if he doesn't come on, this will end up being a really bad trade for it. So I'm just going to say moderate for now. But Port Adelaide fans, let me know what you think. One thing I'll say as well, they also traded their future first into this year's draft, which you'd have to say is probably a good move. Now, after a few years of not taking many draft picks, 
or high ones. Port Adelaide have a good, solid presence in this year's draft. That is a small win, so that also comes into it. Richmond, this one might be my hot take one. This is an interesting one to assess, really interesting. So I think everyone can clue they did really well with the deals that they had in front of them. So they got pretty much maximum value for Liam Baker, pick 14. Um, they didn't, that's not a shafting, but it, you know when it plays out a contract, you brace for the possibility you're not going to get full value. And I'd say 14 is a good deal for Richmond. Shea Bolton, they got two firsts. Jack Graham was a free agent. Daniel Rioli, 6 and 23. So in terms of their um, negotiations, the, the deals that they did were really good. So that's one way to look at it. On the other hand, I do really worry about Richmond's best 22 next year. Now, I haven't done an analysis on them, which I intend to do eventually and see what their best 22 looks like. There's so much to play out. So even with eight picks in the first 24, I'm interested to see what they do next. If they take them all, they may do. I am concerned a little bit about banking so hard on the first round of this year's draft. A lot has been said about, you know, comparing these this draft hand to Gold Coast expansion team and GWS expansion team. So in one of those two expansion cases, that draft ended up being good. And in the other, it ended up being terrible. So which way does it go for Richmond? Now, the thing is as well, that's worth considering here. This isn't Richmond's necessarily like their executed strategy. Liam Baker wanted to leave. Shea Bolton wanted to leave. Daniel Rioli wanted to leave. They tried to keep Jack Graham. All these players, maybe only Jack Graham was salvageable. The other two, Bolton and Rioli, were contracted but really wanted to leave from all reports. So I suppose I don't blame Richmond for trading all these players and they did get maximum value here. Had Richmond shopped them around more actively, I would probably be criticizing them and for that that strategy i wouldn't like that strategy however they are just making the best of a bad situation i am still not convinced one to 24 eight picks one through 24 is necessarily going to propel them to having this amazing team by the time tazzy comes around i think there is a great deal of risk here but richmond could not really have done much more to keep these players it sounded like all of them were leaving maybe jack graham was the only one they could have kept but he's also the lesser of all these four players so I don't know how to assess this. This could either be an amazing off season for Richmond where it sets up the next dynasty or whatever, but I do think it's distinctly possible that this sets them back for a long time. So in conclusion, I'm no closer to deciding what to assess. I will say productive probably. I certainly don't think they smashed it. I think there is enough concern here for me for Richmond to bank so heavily on, on the first round of this year's draft for the top 25 picks. On the other hand, they negotiated really well they couldn't have done much more in terms of keeping these players and they made the best of a bad situation. And, you know, there's a lot of clubs that will envy their draft position. It's just come at the expense of a lot of senior bodies. So we'll wait and see on Richmond. I am nervous for them, um, but I suppose on the trade period itself, they did as literally as well as you could have thought, but I'm not going to put them in smashed it. Let's move to the Saints. This is an interesting one. Uh, they lost Josh Battle, but got pick seven. Now they didn't do anything praiseworthy there because that's just the system um, nonetheless I think they'll be happy in a really strong position with 7, 8, 32 and 47 those are four good picks um, it's amazing how they have a much better hand than West Coast but we'll get to West Coast they got Jack McRae um, so an interesting move there I, I think with the connections of St Kilda to Shield and McRae um, it's, it's a curious one where they see their list going forward. So I did a video um, like a week ago looking at every team's premiership window and St Kilda was one of three teams where I was like where did they see themselves going? Because with a good group of under 24 talents, which they'll add to with seven and eight, is that the part of the list they're looking to progress? Because if so, it's just kind of odd that they go for McRae. Is this just getting a senior body in there to protect other younger midfielders? We've seen, you know, over time, like Brad Crouch and Seb Ross, probably not going to take the team forward. Does he come in and just like add it as senior body? He's, a, he's a, quite a big body, isn't he, Jack McRae? And um, at the end of the day, it was cheap. So... I suppose when you just get back to this trade period, battle is a loss, but they got pick seven out of it. Um, is that productive? I mean, they didn't really do anything to secure that pick seven. Nonetheless, I'd still say they're fairly comfortable with this. Is it moderate though? Yeah, look, I, I think they did lose a best 22 player and McRae probably doesn't do enough to make up for that. Um, but that is a good draft hand too. I, I think I'm just going to say moderate. I don't think there's heaps praiseworthy here for St Kilda. But they will be really happy with that seven and eight. I'm talking myself back around. Look, I think I'll probably, oh, probably earn the side of productive. Productive is the wrong word because it implies there was work done. And I'm not actually knocking St Kilda when I say stuff like that. I think I'm just being real, right? Pick seven isn't an amazing trade that they did, 
but it is probably it probably does exceed the value of Josh Battle. So I think overall, St Kilda will be fairly comfortable with the way this thing went. Sydney, not a lot to see here. We can we can move through this one fairly quickly. I would have thought they didn't um, sign anyone. I'd, I'd imagine they're fairly close to the cap being such a damn good team, really good spread of talent. There isn't, you know, the reason they lost the grand final this year wasn't a lack of depth or, you know, lack of list quality. Maybe you could say they need another key forward, but I'd imagine their hands are a little bit tired there. So they let go of Constanti, who was always probably not going to get a contract, and Luke Parker, they tried to drive a hard bargain there, but just got 44 in return. Now, they hold 19, 22, 44, and 59. There has been a lot of talk of them trading 19 and 22 up. Um, there's a few clubs that could be open to that, I would have thought. I think you just say moderate. There's not a lot going in, but going out. Um, they, they obviously want to move up the draft order, which hasn't happened yet. There just isn't too much to say here. So let's put Sydney in moderate. Oh, I'm so sorry. I actually forgot to put North Melbourne in productive. My bad. I uh, wasn't concentrating. All right, we'll get to the West Coast Eagles. This is another tough one to assess. Uh, now, I know that they were the subject of much um, mockery on social media because of one particular trade in particular, and that's fair enough. I was kind of part of that, I suppose. Done a couple of videos on True Eagle about this deal, which I didn't like at all. However, we are looking at the overall mix here. So... Who have we got? Liam Baker, Matt Owies, Jack Graham. Interesting strategy here from West Coast. I actually like the idea of it, right? The execution is probably the part I have a problem with. So West Coast list is very top and bottom heavy. A lot of senior veterans, um, two have left the club now, Barris and Darling. So there's a shift here. And I, I think if you look at West Coast list, they have a lot of players, like half the list under 21. So they're looking at what happens in two, two years down the track when all the veterans are gone these players will kind of shape the senior bodies on this list. Now, there's also the benefit of Graham and Baker playing under McWalter for a period of time. And skill set-wise, they all add something West Coast don't already have. And they also know how to play under that system, which I think has been described as a bit of a more Richmond-esque, chaotic game style that West Coast are going to play under McWalter. So there are some benefits there that are intangible. Darling left, you know, as a bit of a sweetheart deal for Darling, so he can prolong his career. Um, probably wouldn't have featured in the best 22 if we're serious about the rebuild. Same thing with Barris here. Um, again, would have been best 22, but we decided to move him on four picks. Now he left for money, but we didn't re-sign him for that reason. So West Coast's objectives in this trade period were to get Liam Baker, Jack Graham, Matt always was kind of a last minute thing. And it was also to maximize draft um, picks and access, right? So the awkward thing for here, West, West Coast is their job of getting into or, you know, strengthening their draft hand in 2024, they have done a bad job of that. To hold 12, 26, 73 makes it the sixth worst draft hand in the competition for a team that was pretty poor this year, let's be honest. On the other hand, they hold oh, basically a whole extra draft next year. They held Hawthorne's first, seconds and thirds, as well as their own first, seconds and thirds. So it's there is a chance West Coast salvage this by trading back into this year's draft in the same way that Essendon could. And if West Coast do a deal for another first round pick in this year's draft, then it really does kind of mitigate this. And West Coast also, you know, probably have one eye on Chad Warner in 12 months time, which I think is a distinct possibility. So I think when it comes down to it, this draft hand, as you currently assess it, is just simply not good enough and they need to fix it i'm going to say that west coast will go firmly into the not ideal category because i think the execution was wrong here the strategy sure but they could have done things differently and finally we're at the western bulldogs all right this is uh, an interesting one so they lost bailey smith caleb daniel and mccray and they got matt kennedy i like that they got matt kennedy i think that was a pretty good move considering the exodus here, well not exodus, but they, you know, they pretty much offloaded Jack McRae, not in their future plans. Bailey Smith, um, I'm sure they would have kept, but you know, that was never going to happen. So again, uh, Caleb Daniel, oh, sorry, as well, 25, that was a reasonable deal on value. So three best 25 players, you'd say, and I think Bailey Smith was important and let's call it what it is. They didn't get a great deal there. However, the Bulldogs were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time here and dealt with a club in Geelong that are uh, kind of notorious for taking a hard stance at the trade period, which is not a knock at them. It's just, it's a fact. I'm sure had they dealt with West Coast, they could have got pick three and some more. 
So in terms of outcomes here, there's a lot more going out than in, in my opinion, with Bailey Smith still being a very good player. Kennedy was a nice sort of cheap one. I don't know exactly what they paid for that in the end, but I think it was something in the second round, or late second round, and their future hand is largely left untouched. They also went for Xavier O'Halloran. That was always going to be a long shot. He was contracted and GWS were losing so many players that they had every right to just say no, and that just worked against the Bulldogs. 17, 25, 35, 48. It's not the best hand. It's not terrible. I think overall, you have to say not ideal for the Western Bulldogs. I'm sure they'll be fine. I think they're a very talented list. And um, they obviously just went a whole season without Bailey Smith and made finals and at times looked very good. So they're not screwed or anything like that. But if we're being honest about this mix, I think Matt Kennedy is a slight upgrade on McRae. Caleb Daniel is probably not essential, but still part of that best 22 to 25. I think he lost his spot at one point, but end of the year in the team, so fair enough. Um, Bailey Smith is, is just a blow that they didn't get quite enough uh, value to reflect the talent of the player whilst acknowledging there wasn't too much more they could have done with that. It wasn't as though they accepted a deal on day two that was terrible. They went right to the line and just couldn't get it done. I will say less not ideal here if we're being honest about the outcomes there, but I think it's just unfortunate for the Bulldogs. So there you have it, guys. That is it. I've got the four teams that smashed it. Adelaide, Collingwood, Geelong, Hawthorne. These teams really, really got what they needed done. Again, you could make a case that Fremantle smashed it, but for me, I think Geelong's acquisition of Bailey Smith for so little probably just elevates it for me. Um, these teams, I think, did fairly good jobs considering the circumstances to different extents. These teams, you know, in three cases, they weren't super active. In Port Adelaide's case, it's just hard to know whether they will, you know, rue that trade. I don't know how much more they could have done, so I'm not going to be too harsh on it. And the, the teams that probably lost out, I think GWS losing all those players, the Bulldogs losing Bailey Smith, and West Coast probably unnecessarily trading from three down when there was probably better deals. Had they had the time over, I reckon West Coast would do this differently. So that is my summary. It's ended up being a very long video, guys, but I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you think, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.